Felix here. If you're worried about losing money in the coming stock market crash, this is the video for you. By the end of this, you will know how to never lose money again in a market crash. I'll teach to you, I'll give you the full strategy, exactly what hedge funds do, so stick around till the end. Before we get into that, I have to say this isn't financial advice, and I have to show you that we're up 112% so far on capital employed. We did 126% last year. And is it rocket science? No, it's not. Do I teach it to you? Yes. Is it expensive? No. Why not? Because I actually give it to you for free. I give you my entire trading plan for free. I give you my workbook for free. All you got to do is go to phoenixfriends.org slash webinar, sign up, be one of the 500 who learns. Why do I do it? Because our mission is quite simple. Like We want to make people financially independent. We want to make people financially free. So this is also not a doom and gloom video. This is kind of a fact check realism video. I want you to know the data. I want you to be able to judge it for yourself, come to your own conclusions, but above all, be safer be better prepared. If everybody was, the world would be a better place, right? Everybody would be walking around happy. Okay, give you a couple of data points here and we'll look at whether they are right or wrong. Okay, so this is US stock market capitalization. So the value of all stocks divided by US GDP, gross domestic product, basically the size of the economy. And the theory is, and some people have coined this the Buffett indicator, that, well, if the value of stocks is higher and higher and higher compared to the economy, we're in for a, for a big bang, a big crash. So dot-com bubble was up here. And at the time, we got to about 175% of GDP. So the stock market was significantly almost double the size of the real economy. Where are we right now? Well, right now we're up here. We're right now at about 200% plus. So right now we're at, I don't know, 210%. The stock market is way more than double the size of the US economy. And why is that? Well, I think there is a slight fly in the ointment with this one. People like to point at this one, but US GDP is just one thing. Netflix sells 30% of all their subscriptions overseas. Microsoft has about 40% of all their revenue from overseas. So I think you need to change US to like world GDP. And yeah, it would still be a similar chart, but it wouldn't be quite as crazy. But, 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 let's move on a little bit to a few more data points. This is another one you see quite a lot. The mother of all bubbles. Is this the AI bubble coming in, in, to, to kill us all, that kind of thing? Well, let's look at what we had. In 2000, the internet super bubble burst and we lost 50% of the market. Took about a decade to recover. 2008 housing bubble, 50% down, took about a decade to recover, something like that. Yeah, about seven, eight years on that one. And after that, the market went completely bananas, right? Uh, this rally up here, that one there, is the sort of helicopter money bubble where the governments just woke up one morning and said, you know what would be fun? Why don't we just give away trillions of dollars without tracking it, without any return and just chuck money out of the window, see what happens? Well, the stock market market goes up because money seeks returns. Money therefore goes and invests itself. And on top of that, we now have five point something percent interest rates up here. So that makes it much harder for the money to stay in the stock market because the money wants to go into the bond market where it can get a definite guaranteed 5%. None of that, maybe you will, maybe you won't stock market returned kind of a type thing. So that's why people are thinking, well, what if we get another 50% down? Well, it would mean the S&P would come down to 2,000 points. Just bear that in mind as a number. But here is another one. And I think this is a slightly, well, again, it's, it's a slightly sensible way of looking at it, slightly nonsensical way of looking at it. This is real assets relative to financial assets, the stuff we make up. Now, what are financial assets? Stocks, government bonds since 1925. And you can broadly see it goes like that, right? We've got more financial assets, more kind of made up lofty assets and less real assets, commodities, real estates, that kind of thing, gold. You think that's a real asset. So 
we're at the lowest level ever in terms of assets to where we've ever, 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 ever been. And again, that's an, it's a sign of an inflated financial market, right? That's about one way of looking at it. If it gets better. Well, maybe not better. Maybe it gets worse. What have we got here? If you look at U.S. population, we could get a straightish line. Microsoft says yes. There we go. What does it look like? Well, the U.S. population, you could separate it into the top 20%. So this is the top 20%. The halves, you've got the bottom 20%. That's poverty. And then you've got the 60% in between, right? That's sort of the, roughly the way I, I, I look at it. Now, this chart is slightly diff more differently. It takes it up to 40%, 80% up here, and then 20%. So it makes that 80% and then makes this 40%. So the top 20, they are okay. You don't have to worry about them too much. No, no, you don't need to send them food stamps. They really are okay. But the lowest 20 the lowest 40% even, in white, they're out of money. And you might have expected that. But what you probably didn't expect is that the next 40%, so that the 80% literally, are out of money. They're below their savings levels. They are on average in debt. And that wasn't the case in 2021. It wasn't the case in 2022. It wasn't the case at the beginning of 2023. And one of the reasons we haven't had a recession is because all the helicopter money from the government has been sitting in people's bank accounts and they were therefore able to live a fairly normal life, even if their incomes weren't going up, inflation was eating away at their savings and, and making their lives more expensive. But that money, which the Fed very kindly calls excess savings, which is, tells you something about their intentions and, and your bank balance, that's gone now. So what does that mean? It means there is no more buffer. And that's why this lovely, charming young man, Dimon, warns the world may not be prepared for the Fed at 7%. And you just know, as JP Morgan's CEO, he really cares about the little guy, right? That's, that's where his heart is at. It's, it's to look after the average American on the street. <laughs> no. Why is he warning about this, though? And there's, it's, you know, he's a smart guy. Might not be the most likable guy in the world, but he's a smart guy. Because he runs the most important bank in the world, literally bank countries. And if you look at bank deposits in large banks, they were up here at almost $12 trillion. And this was in 2022, not too long ago. Right now, they're sitting at $10.7 trillion. So we've lost a trillion dollars. That's a thousand billion in bank deposits. Well, where did they go? Socks, basements, holes in the garden as your neighbor been digging? Well, there's just less money around. And that's a strange concept, but we'll get to why in a second. Now, what about small banks? You know, those banks that were going bust in, in March this year and we had almost a collapse in the market. And then the Fed came in and said, don't worry about it. We'll bail you all out. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about accounting C rules. We'll suspend them for you, which is always a good thing, isn't it? It's reassuring. The assets you hold are not worth anything, but we're going to prepare, pretend that they're worth something. Is that a good idea? Apparently. Small banks were also sitting up here and they're now sitting down here. So again, they've lost about 10, 9, 10 percent of their deposits. That's what happens when you have bank runs. And that's concerning, especially if you're running a bank like Dimon. So, you know, include him in your prayers. The man is worried, very, very worried. He's thinking that third yacht I ordered, you think I should postpone it? <laughs> now, what's the actual cause of this all? Is it the Russians? Is it, uh, I don't know, illegal immigrants or, or something on that front. It's a little bit more simple than that. This here is what we call M2. It's money. It's basically money. And money went up in a straight line more than ever before. So <laughs> we were, and you can't make this stuff up, right? So in, say, 2018 uh, here, we had $14 trillion of money. And now we have $21 trillion of money. 
that the Fed added $7 trillion or 50% more money than we had before during COVID. You think they're called some sort of virus that affects the brain? Possibly, right? And by the way, we didn't do this during World War II or at any other time in the history of humankind. But apparently, to make 50 pharma billionaires, it was necessary to create $7 trillion. Couldn't we have just given them a couple of billion each and we would have... Never mind. Let's not get into that. So this is what happened. And that, by the way, causes inflation. Now, let's go back to the market for a moment. And then remember, we're going to get to the teaching bit where you will actually learn how not to lose money and how to protect your portfolio. So stick around. Zero-day options. It's a thing that got invented about a year ago, and it basically means it's an options contract you set up at 9.30 in the morning, it expires at night. You're not an options trader, it's fairly meaningless to you. They were invented so that funds could hedge cheaper, basically. They used to use futures before. But what happened, of course, is that the, the Reddit crowd caught on to it. There is now an ETF trading this stuff. And we give you an idea, a normal options trade versus zero-day options. So the zero-day TTE and normal options trade. The zero DTE has about 50% more profit. So, so far you think, well, obviously that's why everyone's doing it. It also has 100% more risk. So nobody in their right mind does these. Now, if you're doing this and you're making money with it, it's because you're lucky because the market has moved relatively predictably so far. When it stops doing that, when it opens in the green and it closes the day in the red, you've lost 100% of your capital. So please step away from the ledge. It's really not worth it. But what does this mean here? Well, 50% of all the options volume out there now is daily. It expires daily. And that means if the market looks all green and rosy and everyone puts on their bullish positive trades at the beginning of the day and then some bad news happens. Another little bank falls or something happens and the market nosedives 3.5%. That day, you have no idea how much money is going to get wiped out. A tremendous amount. Half of the options potentially. And options are 100 times leveraged. I know it. I'm an options trader. So this is making markets potentially a lot more volatile. Now, something to bear in mind, right? What else have we got? Well, we have inflation, and that's what Dimmon, JP Morgan Dimmon, was warning about. Now, what causes inflation, apart from foreigners and, and, and um, you know, Russians, and, and what else? Who else do we blame? The Mexicans, probably, right? probably the Mexicans' fault, so or maybe Canada's fault. It's probably Trudeau's fault. He's not very likable, is he? No. Oil. Oil is currently trading at about 90-something dollars. That's about 50% higher than it was about three, four months ago. And you're thinking, well, it's going to come down again because Papa Biden is pumping out the strategic oil reserve to everybody and he'll buy himself a re-election. That reserve, by the way, was created so that if there was actually an oil shock and somehow the U.S. couldn't get oil, that's what it was for. It wasn't really going to get reelected. But, I mean, tell that to a politician. They're not going to listen, are they? We're going to get, according to OPEC data, a massive, massive oil shortage in the end of the quarter, which is, of course, engineered by OPEC, who are the people who benefit from it, right? If you're a Saudi potentate, if you're sitting in your gold palace and you're thinking... Shall I lower the price of oil or should I increase the price of oil? Well, I think you're going to increase the price of oil so you can buy another, I don't know, I don't know what they've got left to buy. Probably not a lot, but, you know, something. And there is a solution to this, and the French came up with it. So don't worry about a thing. France has come up with it. They're going to save us all. France has said, France, France's uh, president has said, to its oil majors, sell oil at zero dollar profit. And the oil majors turned around and laughed themselves to death. I mean, ridiculous, obviously. Not going to happen. No, we don't live in communism. But price 
fixing price caps in the to protect us from inflation might be something that might come back, by the way. We've had those before. It's a populist thing to do. It doesn't achieve anything. And, and you want to know why? Because if if oil companies were selling at zero profit, what would what would that do to investment in oil infrastructure? Investment would tank. What would therefore happen? Supply down the road would fall, and therefore prices would go up, and actually we'd have more inflation than before. So, I mean, really, politicians, put them all in the box and send them to Mars. That's what I say. Let's come back to present day again. Prime book percentage. Felix, what's with the charts? I know. Give me a second. So funds, hedge funds, you know, the ones you see on Billions, that lovely TV show, they are percentage of total U.S. internet tech shorts appraiser. So they are now 40% of all the shorts, which just means people betting on the stocks falling on tech. And that is semiconductors and semiconductor equipment. So if you're massively into NVIDIA or TSMC or any of those, well, the hedge funds are betting against you massively. And yes, there may be days when you win and they get squeezed and the market goes up. But generally speaking, these guys got billions more than you, way better information than you and me, and therefore I don't bet against them. It's a bit like betting against the Fed. You're also not going to win, are you? Daily CTA flow, translate please. CTA flow are algo funds, computers trading on their own. I know it's a worrying thing, isn't it? They're probably going to be worse than fund managers. At the present prices of the S&P, we're expecting some tremendous selling from algo funds. This is billions of dollars. So in October, we're expecting, I don't know, 50 billion or something like that in sale, sales, 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 sell orders from algo trade funds. And that doesn't mean the market has to crash. There might be people who buy it and it goes back up. But it's, again, something that goes against us, which makes me a little bit teeny-weeny worried. But then you're saying, hang on, hang on, hang on, Felix. I listen to the Labour Department. I listen to Papa Biden, sorry, El Presidente. And by the way, I have no political affiliation towards any anybody who runs the United States. I'm not an American, couldn't really care less. But I shall take the piss out of all of them. And they're saying the labor market is strong. Well, look at this. Every single month this year, the Labor Department has revised the payroll data downwards. So they give us a bullish number here and there and there and here and there and there and here and again in August. And then they come in and they go later, we revised it downwards. No, don't tell anyone. It was seasonally adjusted. Something to do with statistics that's really complicated and nobody needs to understand. Man. And they've done that here and here and here and here and here and there and here and undoubtedly in August. And therefore, the total difference here between what's been reported originally and what we actually got is pretty, pretty bloody enormously tremendous. And had we gotten the real data, the revised data, if that is in fact the real data at the beginning, we'd be in a very, very different situation. Interest rates would be lower. The stock market will probably be higher. But there we go. I don't believe the labor market data one teeny tiny bit. Now, here's something that's a little bit um, sobering. On the left here, you've got GDP growth. And then you start in 1790, which I know is very useful. But let's just start here, World War II. And you can see that GDP growth has been declining. And that's what happens in most major economies. We just can't find ways to grow that easily because we've built all the bridges and all the infrastructure and all the easy stuff. We put up all the buildings we don't really need anymore. And at the same time, the total U.S. government debt, which is the black line here, this is debt which is why I circled the 1930s, because that was a fairly, fairly decent reason to like issue some debt, right? We're fighting a war in every country in the world, and it's basically us against evil, right? I'm German, so I'm the evil. And right now, we're up here. You might be thinking, that's okay, the money isn't worth that much. Well, it's as a percentage of GDP. 
So what do you say about that? Right? So we're basically spending more and more and more. We're getting less and less and less for it. It's called diminishing returns in economics. And it's the point where if you're a rational human being, you turn around. But we don't have rational human beings running the country, so they're going to just keep speeding faster, faster, faster towards the cliff edge. Yeah, that's where we are. Okay, well, what is the debt? Um, well, the government tells you we have about 30, I think it's about 33 trillion now in debt. It's actually a lot more than that because there are so-called unfunded obligations, which is a small element of $75 trillion, which has been pushed off the balance sheet because it just doesn't look good. Because then we'd have over 100 trillion debt. And I say we, I mean Americans. I don't pay U.S. tax. Um, I do actually pay a little bit of U.S. tax, but not a lot. Company. But that's not good. <laughs> it's simple. There really isn't much you can say about that. Now, the shutdown. The shutdown that's coming for the government is all about protecting you as America's taxpayer so more money doesn't get squandered and swindled and sent to somewhere you don't care about. No, it's not true. Sorry. First of all, if the shutdown lasts, say, four weeks, you are reducing GDP by 1 percentage point. But last eight weeks, it's 1.9 percentage points and so on. So what are you doing? You are actually reducing GDP and you're therefore effectively increasing debt levels as a percentage of GDP, which is kind of what matters. And you're not actually reducing de expenditure either because you're going to have to just that's back pay. You, you pay it back. So the, all those employees are not getting paid. They're going to get their pay when the government opens again. Um, but there is one big good, good piece of news. Um, Ukrainian employees are going to get paid, just not American ones. Just make, make sure you know where the priorities are in the US. Now, how do you protect yourself? Okay, the first thing you do, I'll walk you through this. You go to optionswatch.io. It's a lovely website. Most brilliant website you've ever seen. We're building it. <laughs> and you type in, and I'm going to run this through an example of Microsoft. You could do this with any stock. It doesn't really matter what it is, just because Microsoft is a reasonable stock that a lot of people might own. Uh, and therefore, I thought I'd, I'd run through it with that. So what do you do? In here, you type in Microsoft, or at least the first part of that. And then you'll see Microsoft here. You click on that. And then it takes you to the next screen which looks like this. And you might be thinking, no, Felix, not more of your options. Surely not. Seriously, three minutes, and you will never, ever look at your portfolio or the stock market again. You will now know how to protect yourself, how to never lose money again. Does that sound good? Is that a fair, fair deal? All right. Let's do this in three minutes. Stock chart. You're familiar with that one. Nothing new here. On the right-hand side, you've got profit and loss of options. And you're like, oh, no. Up here... It's a little drop-down box. You select long put. You're buying a put. Why? Hedge funds hedge by buying a put. A put is an instrument that protects you. It makes money when the market goes down. Now you go and you move that. This is the share price now. That's now. You need to go down a bit. You can't eliminate all risk. There is an acceptable risk. So at the moment, we're trading at 317 or something like that. We're going to select $300 down here as our cutoff where we start to make money on this hedge. And that means you've got about minus 8% or something like that, which is an acceptable risk. You can't be in the market and go, I want zero risk. 8% doesn't destroy you, right? You can still go to sleep. You'll be fine. Minus 80%, what a lot of people did last year, you're done for, basically. It's, you're screwed in terms of capital appreciation. So how do we do that? We literally sell a $300 put. And now we go and look in the top right corner here, and we look at the data. So it's going to cost us $104 to buy this. And you're like, I don't want to spend money on this. Bear with me. I'm going to show you I can do this for free. Potentially, you could make $29,895. Okay, no one's arguing with me on that one, right? If Microsoft really does go down a lot. I mean, that would be, 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 be severe, but let me show you. This is the life thing. So say Microsoft went to... Hang on. Say Microsoft went to 285. Well, you'd be making a 1,371% return. 
not too shabby, right? The more it goes down, the more crazy your return gets, basically. So it goes to 240, you're making 5,600% return. That's the idea of a hedge. So remember, $104 is what it cost us to set this up. We don't want to spend $104 because that would be annoying. And by the way, this is a weekly setup. I did it for next week because I have only three days left till Friday. But you could do this every Monday morning for the week. You could also do a two-week time frame. Works out about the same thing. But you want to do this quite short term. And I'll explain to you why in a second. How do we get, do we get this done for free? Well, to start with, I should have said this at the opening. I'm assuming that you own 100 shares of Microsoft in this case or whatever stock you're doing this on. It's on any stock. It's on an ETF. It doesn't really matter in anything. But it's important you own 100 shares. And you can therefore sell what people call a covered call, which isn't in itself a great strategy, by the way. It doesn't make enough money. But in this instance, it's quite a good one. So again, we go out with the same time frame. 11 days in this case, but you could do it weekly. And we sell a covered call, and that brings us $138. Now remember, it costs us $104 to do the protection, so we're actually left with $34, which is nice. So you could buy yourself a, I don't know what, um, a shovel uh, to bury the gold, but, uh, you know, something. Or you take the money and reinvest it. Slightly more sensible. So how did we do that? Well, we set up a call that we sell. This is a call we sell. And again, we didn't do this here where we are right now. We did it above the market. Why? Because you want the stock to stay below this level so that you get your $138. Because what happens if you're going above this dotted line? Up here, you sell your stock. And it's an automatic thing. So the bad thing, well, you're selling it at $330. It's not such a bad thing, slightly above it, in fact, $331. So you pay a profit. And all you can then do is you get the cash. You just go and buy the stock again, if you like it. So a little bit of a transaction cost. That'll occasionally happen to you if there is an unexpected rally. But if you think we're near the top of a market and you think the fear is more that it's going to go down, then it's a fairly good setup in this kind of a situation. So what have we done? We have sold a call above the market. That got us $138. We then took $104 to buy a put below the market, so below the current share price, which is our protection. And we got $34 left and we bought something nice with it. Couple of shares of safe fund. <laughs> not financial advice, obviously. So that's basically it. That's it. That's it. It's really not that complicated. Um, and 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 by the way, if you just think ah, I don't need to do that, I don't need to worry about it. Of course, you'd be right because Fed's Yellen, Fed President Yellen, formerly, she said in 2017 there will be no new financial crisis in our lifetime. Remember 2018? So the next time the Fed or the government or anybody in office tells you don't worry about a thing, that's when you go out and you buy puts. That's what I do. <laughs> right? The more they tell you it's all going to be fine, the more I freak the heck out. And I don't freak the heck out because I know I'm hedged. I know I can make money. I actually quite enjoy a down market. It's actually quite easy to make money on that. Two things I'd love you to do. And then you would really round up the day like... 10x before you were today. Join my live trading training at webinar, and I will teach you my entire strategy, how we are up a freakish 100 and something percent, 112 percent so far, ROCE. I'll give you the whole rock I rate, ROCE, the whole strategy. And secondly, if you want to learn more about how the stock market really works, our core program, we give it away for 99% off at the moment. Why? So it means you are not paying the typical $1,500 to 
No, you're literally paying 15 bucks for it. And it'll help you really understand how the market actually works and what makes a good investment and what doesn't. And it'll literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people run through it who all say me really tell me really nice things. So if you go to the website, felixfans.org slash stocks and um, just click on checkout, it'll automatically apply the coupon for you. You do those two things, you potentially learn about trading. See if that's something you want to be interested in on, on, on the live trading. And you've got your stock investment down to a T with the 99% off. And why don't I give it away? Because people don't complete the program if I give it away. I have to charge you 15 bucks for it. Otherwise, you won't complete it because people don't value what's free. Isn't that weird? It's just the way we're wired. If you enjoyed this video, come and smash the you know what button and possibly watch one of the next videos that gets suggested to you.